So then, uh, today the Feast of St. Pius the First, and um, we will be back here again in Venita. It's been, been a while, hopefully it won't be so long again before we make back the next trip. So it's been about 10, 11, 12 weeks, so it's been a while, so it's good to be back. So, a few considerations, and Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. A few reminders or considerations again on our our crisis, a little crisis in the society of St. Pius X, or crisis in tradition. Really, it's a Vatican IIb that's going on within the society of St. Pius X. And just like in the 1960s, for many souls who could not believe that the Catholic Church could go through a crisis, we all know that there's been bad popes, bad bishops, bad priests, all down the last 2,000 years, starting with Judas and St. Peter, who were bad bishops when they were newly ordained. And Peter repented, Judas did not. And from the very, very beginning, our Lord said that there would be weeds or cockle and wheat in his garden, in the church. So we have known that there has been this mystery of iniquity inside of the Catholic Church for the last 2,000 years, and that there will always be bad priests and good priests, bad bishops and good bishops, bad popes, and good popes, so they can't be at the same time, and also bad faithful and good faithful. We also know that there will be many times in the history of the church, including even the best times, when the majority will not be pleasing to God. Just like St. Paul said, that all passed through the crowd, cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were under the cloud, and all were passed through the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, but with most of them, God was not well pleased. And that was with Moses. Moses, the head of the people. Moses, who it would say in the book of Deuteronomy, that there was no man like unto him before him, no man like unto him after him. And yet, under the greatest leader of the Old Testament, a type of Christ himself, with most of those people under the direction of Moses, God was not well pleased. We travel through the lives of the saints. St. Vincent Ferrer looked at the world around him, and St. Vincent Ferrer saw that the world was filled with wickedness a thousand years ago, and that there were wicked priests and wicked bishops and wicked faithful. He said, this is so great, the wickedness in the church, so great, the wickedness in the world, so great, the wickedness of man, that surely the Antichrist is coming very soon. And that's what he thought a thousand years ago. Because when we open our eyes and see the real world around us, we will see that that world is filled with sin. It is filled with sin now in 2015. It was filled with sin in 1015. It was filled with sin in the year 15. It was filled with sin 500 years before the birth of Christ. And it shall be found that it is filled with sin at the end of times. And it won't be a new thing. Because our Lord Jesus Christ told us, when I come at the end of the world, it's going to be just like it was in the old days. It's going to be like it was in the days before Noah. That was the old days. That was the really old days. 1,656 years after he made the world, God wiped away the world because of sin. And he washed it away with water. And he killed every man, woman, child, and beast on the earth, except for two of each kind, and seven of the birds, and eight men. Eight human beings. Everyone else is wiped out because of sin. And so when we open our eyes with faith, and when we open our eyes with the Spirit of Christ, we will see around us the world is filled with wickedness. And so what are we to do? What did the apostles do? When the apostles opened their eyes and saw the world filled with wickedness, all the homosexuality that was popular throughout Greece and Rome a thousand years, two thousand years ago. Now homosexuality has come back. Now it's throughout the whole world. Now they're making laws to make homosexuality legal everywhere in the world. And now they're reaching to the point of homosexual marriages being declared to be legal. And they're waiting for God. Calling down God's wrath upon our country. Calling down God's wrath upon our world. So that he will come and punish it as he has done before in the past. When we open our eyes and we see the individuals, we will see that each individual is a sinner. 
we open our eyes and we see the church, we feel that it's, we see that it's filled with sinners. And one of the great mistakes that a human being who is a Catholic can make, and is in fact a deceit of the devil, is to make us look at the church as to who's a sinner and who's not. It's like the old country song, want to find out who's cheating who and who's being true. Everybody wants to find out who's cheating God, who's being true to God, who's a good Catholic, who's a bad Catholic, who's a good priest, who's a bad priest, who's a good bishop, who's a bad bishop. And this kind of analysis is not the analysis of God. It's a very interesting analysis of the world. It is the worldly way of thinking. It is the natural way of thinking. We want to know who's doing evil, who the bad guys are. We want to know the names of all the communists, the names of all the masons, the names of all the bad guys. This is a very natural thing. So that if we see them, we can turn ourselves away from them, or we can defend ourselves against them, or we can fight them. And we forget, in the end, there is only one bad guy. And in the end, there's only one good man. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself told us, there is none good but God. And where did all evil come from? It came from one word spoken by one angel. One word spoken by one angel is the fount of all evil. And that angel said, non serviam. I will not serve. And what would he not serve? He would not serve a God who would become man. He would not serve a God who would make Mary his mother. And he would not serve a God who would put a woman above him. He would not serve a God who would be incarnate in human flesh. He could not stand the truth of God. When that God, his son, became man, he spoke to Pilate. And when he was in front of Pilate, Pilate asked him, who art thou? I am the truth. He told the apostles just a few nights before, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Art thou a king, says Pilate? Thou sayest it. I am a king. For this was I born. For this came I into the world, that I might bear witness to the truth. So kingship and truth are glued together. And they can never be separated Power and truth are glued together and they can never be separated. Action and truth are glued together and they can never be separated. And he who is of the truth hears my voice. Whoever hears the voice of Christ hears the truth. And here he begins to give us the answer. How do we look at the crisis in the church with the eyes of faith? How do we look at the crisis of the Society of St. Pius X, which is the precise same crisis of Vatican II happening once again on a smaller scale? In certain ways more grave because they're attacking the, the shock troops, attacking the, the ones that were trying to defend the faith down the last 40 years. And now they've given it up. And so there's a great attack of the faith against the faith by the devil. And the battle is a battle of the devil versus Christ. Not good men versus bad men or good angels versus bad angels. It's the devil versus Christ. Satan versus Christ. The father of lies versus the truth. And how do we fall into the trap of the devil? Through lies. The devil always gets us through lies. Through error and lies, he gets us into his kingdom. And then we turn to homosexuality. And then we turn to adultery. And then we turn to all manner of stealing, and we call it justice in modern business. And then we turn to all manner of evil. We turn to pride and selfishness. And we call it all virtue. How does it all begin? With lies. How do we defeat it? With truth. And that is why God made his apostles to go out and preach the truth. Of course, they're supposed to be a good example. When a young man is being ordained a priest, one of the minor orders is the order of acolyte. There are seven steps to the altar. The porter opens and closes the door, allowing the good people in and the bad people to stay out. 
So that's the lowest thing a priest does. Let good people in and bad people out. And then the next one is an, act, is an, is a, an exorcist. Some bad people still make it in the church because the devil is good to decide, good to, um, uh, I mean, the lector who reads, and the second is the lector who reads the catechism and teaches the faith and reads the books of the Old Testament to the faithful that they might know the teachings of Christ because we must be educated. And the third is the exorcist. The exorcist, there are those people that made it into the church and they looked holy. There's those people that learned their catechism and know it very well, but the devil is still in them. And so the third duty of the priest is to get to that third level of the attack. And what is he to do? Drive out the devil. This is a minor order. We have major orders and minor orders. We call them orders because they're steps to the priesthood or degrees. We can also call them instructions. There are important things you have to do, and there's unimportant things you have to do, and you need to do both. If you don't have salt, you won't be able to preserve your food. But it's more important to have meat than it is to have salt. It's more important to have substance than it is to have the things that go on top of it. And yet you need both. And the fourth minor instruction is acolyte. Because some people, when you drive the devil out of them, it doesn't work. Stage three, the exorcist. And so the fourth stage is the acolyte. The acolyte carries a candle in the church. The acolyte brings the water and wine to the altar. And when, he, when the bishop gives the acolyte a candle, he says, be an example. You will walk with a light. You will carry a candle throughout the sanctuary so that people will see you. Let them see your good works. And be a good example to the faithful that they might turn to God. And that's the fourth minor instruction. Now one of the deceits of the devil is to turn the minor instructions into major instructions. And to make them the priorities. There will always be a priest who's a good example on the outside, but has a devil on the inside. There will always be a priest who's not a perfect example on the outside, and yet God is on the inside. And we are not good judges of these things. And therefore there's no security in judging who's carrying a good light and who's carrying a bad light. Who's a good one and who's a bad one. There's no security in that. God alone judges the heart. God alone knows what's inside the heart of man. Many appear good and they are wicked. Many appear wicked and they are good. God alone knows what's inside the heart. Therefore it is not for us to judge. And what does he say? Judge not lest ye be judged. He says in the Sermon on the Mount. And yet we must judge just judgments. And he also commands we must judge just judgments. He tells us to judge and not to judge. What are we to judge? We are to judge the truth. We are to judge the lies. What are we not to judge? We are not to judge the one who speaks the truth. We are not to judge the one who speaks the lies. We are not to judge the persons, but we are to judge the truths. We must judge just, just judgments. Just like in a murder trial. They discover what happened. Here are the elements. There is the gun. There are the fingerprints. This fingerprints and these guns point to you. You have the gunpowder on your clothes. You were there at the time of the murder. The evidence points that you were there at the time of the murder. And according to the law, you must be hung by the neck until dead at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. And so 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, we have a hanging. And why the reason for the hanging? Because the evidence points to the action that was done by the man who was found guilty. And not because I think he did it. I think he's bad. Oh, I don't think he did it. I think he's good. There must be a judgment according to the facts. And a judgment according to the truth. And a judgment according to the external evidence. This is the way to judge. Now we look at our present crisis in the church. What is this crisis? The crisis of the church is a crisis of faith. Let our judgment be on the realm of faith. The crisis of the church that is going on in the world today is that the faith, the true faith of our Lord Jesus Christ is no longer being taught. And it is no longer being publicly defended. Therefore, when we judge, we must judge just judgments 
according to the external things that are public and known. And so we look at our present crisis in the Society of St. Pius X. What does the Car Unum say, the official bulletin of the Society of St. Pius X? What does the SSPX.org tell us about modernism, which it says is a philosophical trend prevalent even today? It's like saying Satan is an angel amongst the many angels of the nine choirs, and leaving out the fact that he's a bad angel and one that's going to help you get to hell. Can't say those kind of things. Philosophical trend is not what modernism is. St. Thomas, St. Pius Sint doesn't tell us that. He tells us modernism is a heresy and the synthesis and collection and synthesis of all heresies that pulls together all the wickedness of all heresies in one place and then spreads it with vomit throughout the entire world causing the damnations of millions and millions and millions of souls. It's not a philosophical trend. This is what is taught by St. Pius X in Pashendi. We are not dealing with philosophical trends. But this new society tells us it's a philosophical trend. And what does it say in the doctrine? In the teaching of the mainstream society? The actual official teaching, not the individual private opinions of individual priests. And some individual priests think that Bishop Filet is wrong. Others think he's right. Others think that he's half right and half wrong. Some think he's three quarters right and one quarter wrong. Some think he's seven eighths right and one eighth wrong. Some think he's seven eighths wrong and one eighth right. Everyone has different opinions. Some hate him, some like him, etc. In all different levels. And how can we know what is inside the heart of a man? It is not our concern, but the concern of God. Furthermore, we have an obligation to assume the best. That if someone is doing something, that most likely, perhaps they're doing it for a good reason, or they feel that they have a good reason for it. So if a doctor tells you, take these three tablets of cyanide so that you'll feel better and take away your headache, it will take away your headache along with your life. Don't listen to that doctor. Maybe the doctor is an idiot. Maybe the doctor is a murderer. Maybe he's related to Kevorkian. But the fact is, we don't listen to that doctor. Because what he's giving is bad medicine, and the bad medicine should not be taken. And so, what about our mainstream society, St. Pius X? The July 14th statement of the general chapter of 2012, it was issued to the world, tells us that Vatican II remains tainted with errors. Tainted with errors. Remains tainted with errors. What does that mean in the French language, in the English language, in the Latin language, in any other language? It means that there is no error in the council. Only the stain remains. Just as we tell you after you're baptized, original sin is gone, but the taint remains. The taint of original sin remains. That is, there's a stain of original sin. There's a wound of original sin, which will cause you to have darkening of the intellect, weakening of the will, and a strong inclination to evil, even though the sin is wiped away. The original sin is gone, but the taint remains. So likewise, in that chapter statement, it says, and the taint remains. Michael Matt wrote a letter about this back in 2012. You will see, he said, that this is a new foundational important document, most important document for the SSPX. Because for the first time, they don't say Vatican II is an error. For the first time, they don't condemn the council. For the first time, it's not heretical and it's not wrong and it's not bad. For the first time. We all know there's problems in the council, says Michael Matt. We all know that. So many terrible problems and horrible things happened after the council. But it is another thing to say the council itself is evil. And for the first time, the SSPX says in a public statement, the council has problems that came after it. The council has the taint of problems, but it does not say the council is in heresy. It does not say the council is in error. It does not say the council is wrong. And this absence is most grave. 
and it's public. Therefore, it's the obligation of a priest who knows the truth that we, were learned, we learned in the seminary and that we learned from our founder, Archbishop Lefebvre, and we learned from the teachings of the church down the last 2,000 years. That a council that tells us ecumenism, religious liberty, and, and modernism, the simplest version to say modernism, the synthesis of all heresies, must be condemned as erroneous and heretical, as against God, as leading souls to hell, as the most grave and pernicious error. This is what we must say and what we must do. Now, it is not done. And it has not been done. And many argue within the society and within the resistance. Should we make a deal with Rome? Should we not make a deal with Rome? The answer is no. One of my classmates says it's really very simple. One can only make a deal with one's equals. So if you and I are equals, we can make a deal. But you cannot make a deal with a subject, and you cannot make a deal with a superior. With a superior, you either obey or you disobey, but you cannot make a deal. You cannot make an agreement. France can make an agreement with Germany. Germany can make an agreement with America. America can make an agreement with England, and so on, because they are each independent countries equal to one another. Therefore, we can make an agreement. You ship over all your tea, we'll bury it inside of the harbor. No problem. So we can make a deal. We can make an agreement. Why? Because they're equals. But you cannot make an agreement with a superior. You either obey him because he follows the law of God, or you disobey him because he goes against the law of God. When he turns back to the law of God, you obey him again. When he turns against the law of God, you disobey him. And so the very notion of making a deal with Rome is against the principles of obedience, against the principles of the Catholic teaching about authority. It is against the principles of the faith. We cannot speak of making a deal with Rome. All we do is, when Rome, the light of faith, shines back over eternal Rome, then... We obey. And all things are solved. All problems are solved. But when the light of faith does not shine over Rome, even though Pope Francis has a reputation for being a really holy Catholic, the fact is, the light of faith is not shining over Pope Francis, who comes and tells us that he's worried about the cities and worried about the environment and doesn't believe in the Catholic God. He's not protecting the innocent. He's protecting the environment while Catholics are being murdered throughout the world. And not only Catholics, but other people are being murdered throughout the world. And he is not defending any of them. These are not the, the signs that faith has shined over Rome. And that the good shepherd has returned to the flock. He has not returned. The signs are not there. And so to say that the light of faith has shined over Rome means that we have another faith than the light of the true faith. Archbishop Lefebvre said in 1974... We must reject and refuse all of the reforms that come from Vatican II. Don't say the luminous mysteries. Don't do the blessing of ashes for the dead. Don't do the modern prayers. Don't do the modern devotions. Why? Because they came from modernist Rome. Therefore, we reject them all. And what do we do? We stand firm on the traditions of our fathers. And we don't change those traditions. And then when the light of faith returns to Rome, they will be back to the same traditions that have been handed down to us. We'll find them in Rome. They will go back to the same teaching that I found in my catechism as a little child. It will be back to the teaching of Rome. We will recognize the voice of the Holy Father because he will speak as the Holy Fathers of the 2,000 years before him. And we should not look at who is good and who is bad? Who is just and who is unjust? And this is the reason why we claim that it's far more charitable. Far more charitable to say to souls, you should not go to the mainstream society of St. Pius X Masses. It is dangerous to your soul. 
You should not go to the fraternity of St. Peter Masses. It is dangerous to your souls. You should not go to the new Mass. It is dangerous to your souls. You should not go to the St. Evicondus Mass because it is dangerous to your souls. Why? Because each one of them says something that is contrary and not in line with the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ down the last 2,000 years in His Holy Church. That's the reason. And there are many priests inside the Novus Ordo. I know many of them, friends with some friends with quite a few of them, who hate Vatican II, who cannot stand the new Mass. One priest told the Fraternity of St. Peter priest, the priest I was friend with about 10 years ago, a Fraternity of St. Peter priest told him the new Mass was good. And that priest that said the new Mass every day said, I say it every day. Trust me, it's not good, it's evil. <laughs> The Novus Ordo priest who said the new mass every day told the fraternity of St. Peter priest who doesn't say the new mass. It was Novus Ordo priest that said, I know it's evil because I say it every day. It was a Novus Ordo priest that told me when I was newly ordained, only a couple years of priest. I said the standard society line of our sister Lefebvre. The new mass is not, new missal is not heretical. It only tends to heresy. And he said, no. It's heretical, and I can prove it to you. I know, because I say it every day. So he pulled out the missile, and he showed me the heresy. February 24th, the feast of St. Peter, uh, the chair of St. Peter. Uh, we have found, but, oh, P, oh, Christ, oh Lord, you have founded your church on Peter's confession of faith. Heresy, taught by the Protestants, condemned by the Council of Trent. The Lord did not build his church on Peter's confession of faith. He built his church on St. Peter. And what does it say inside of the missal approved by the Paul VI? Uh, the missal wasn't approved, but uh, elements of it were approved. It says you that uh, a heresy about the papacy. There are other heresies contained in it as well. That Novus Ordo priest still says Novus Ordo priest to this day. Novus Ordo mass to this day. We still keep in contact from time to time. Very nice priest. And why do many of these priests stay in the Novus Ordo? Because of false obedience. Many of them mean very well. And they're trying to learn the truth. And they suffer more than we do. And they're trying their very best. And they're trying to preach the faith the best they can. But what's the problem? They're not standing for the truth that is handed down whole and entire down the last 2,000 years. And therefore, what do we tell them? Father, you need to stop saying the new Mass. You need to start saying the Latin Mass. You need to leave behind all this modernism. And you need to come to the truth. And it is not charitable to tell them, Father, as long as you mean well, as long as you're trying your best, keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. No. In the mainstream society of St. Pius X, it is changing. It's just a fact of life. It is changing. And this society of St. Pius X does not communicate the same books that they communicated before, the same doctrines. It doesn't have the same manner of speech. It doesn't have the same manner of operating. It doesn't speak the same, doesn't act the same in any way what it has for the last 40 years. What is, the, what is the effect of this? Weakening of the faith. Weakening of the faith. Now we know that, I was speaking to a priest just yesterday, of course you must tell the faithful clearly and simply, said this priest, we, you should not go to mainstream society masses. It's a danger. But you have to be the one to make that decision. Because this is a crisis in the church. We have to recommend that which is right. We have to recommend that which is true. And we have to explain the reason why. But because of the crisis in the church, it is not sufficient that you say, Father said, therefore I'm not going to SSPX masses anymore. No. You must know your faith. You must study your faith. You must understand. And you also must not make the mistake of saying, well, I know my faith well enough that it can't harm me. If what the society is teaching is not correct according to the gospel, in its official teaching, even though the individual priest, you know, and many, many priests in the Novus Ordo, they never preach a single heresy. They're very careful to follow the catechism of the Council of Trent. 
very careful to try to teach the Catholic doctrine the best that they can, especially some of these younger priests who are trying their best to be good Catholic priests, who wear their cassocks, who are trying to tell people to make good confessions, who use a traditional formula for confession, who tried to get themselves ordained in the traditional rite by a Nova Soto bishop, <laughs> doubtfully valid. But they're trying to get themselves Catholic, and they're reading St. Thomas Aquinas, and they have the Summa, and they're trying their very best. But they're saying the new Mass. And when they say the Latin Mass, it's in the indult of the approval of Vatican II. And so though they personally do not approve of Vatican II, they openly and publicly approve of Vatican II. They're like a soldier who wears the uniform of the army. He represents the army, whether he hates the army or not, whether he dislikes a general or not. He represents the army. So long as he's wearing that uniform. And if wearing that uniform, he fights against the general secretly, that is called subversion. It is not the way of a Catholic. He may do it with good intentions, and God may not judge us so harshly, but it's still objectively wrong. Subversion is not acceptable. <coughs> Like Father, one of my classmates told me several years ago, when you're given a bad command, there's four options. Agree and obey. Given any command, agree and obey. Disagree and obey. Disagree and resist. And if you... So I guess there's three options. Disagree and resist. And so that you can either... Uh, and disagree and disobey, I guess is the fourth option. So you can agree and obey. That's a correct option for a moral man. You can disagree and resist. And that's a correct option for a moral man. But to disagree and obey, and to agree and, to agree and disobey, these are not Catholic options. The subverted man, he disagrees and he obeys until the time comes when he can stab him in the back. Have a secret takeover. These are not options for the Catholic. What do we stand on? The truth. The fact is that there is a new teaching publicly professed by the superiors. Bishop Filet in the latest Corunum apparently talks about again the importance of being united with Rome. Being approved by Pope Francis. We're already approved by Christ. We're already approved by Holy Mother the Church. We're already Catholics, living our Catholic faith. We don't need approval. We don't need it. And we know also that when the time of the light of faith shining over Rome happens again, the approval will be given back to us. And so we're not worried. Just like Archbishop Lefebvre said, I'm not worried at all. I take no care. I take no worry whatsoever about the punishments that may come to us the next few days. He said that on June the 30th, 1988 as he consecrated four bishops for the good of the church. I'm not worried about the excommunications they're going to try to come up with. They'll come up with some document. They'll come up with some excommunication, some condemnation. I care not for it. It doesn't bother me at all. Because I know that just like in this case of the suspension in 1975 and the suppression in 76, Rome came back later and said, you did a good thing in disobeying us. You did a good thing in continuing. We're really grateful you did that. So likewise, I am confident. And he is still right 40 years later. 2009 doesn't count. That one day the church will say you did right in those consecrations. And one day the church will say it was okay. And one day the church will, will give gratitude to the Society of St. Pius X for continuing the Catholic priesthood and the Catholic faith. 2009 was not that day. That was a day of compromise, when in 2009, the four bishops wrote a letter saying, we apologize, we want to be brought back in. And an answer to this letter of the four bishops, Rome said, we lift the excommunications. Excommunications that could not be lifted, because they were never laid down. They could not be removed, because they never existed. This was a lie. This was not of God. And what was the result of it? The weakening of the Catholic faith and Catholic tradition and the strengthening of the devil's position. So in our present crisis in the society, we have to remind ourselves what we stand for is the truth. We're not against individuals, but we are against errors. And as a member of the Society of St. Pius X, 
When my superior writes a public document that says that Vatican II is tainted with error, I am obliged to imitate St. Paul. And the obligation is a grave one. And I am obliged to stand up to my superior and say, this is wrong, and I resist you to the face. And when they put six conditions, of which three of them are clearly against the law of God, and one of them is a grave error against the faith, the first condition, by which we're asking permission to be able to criticize individuals, which we cannot ask permission for, and not to criticize the errors, which we must criticize. We must condemn that first wicked condition. We must condemn this as a second wishable condition that says we are willing to put ourselves, our sheep, under the direction of modernist bishops who wish their loss of faith, who wish their reamalgamation back into the mainstream church. Whether they have good intentions or not, that's what they want. They want your souls back in the mainstream church, which is not the church of Christ. Therefore, we must fight against them. We are not against them as individuals or against their intentions, but against the things that they're doing that's contrary to the faith. And there's stability when we stand upon truth. There's stability when we stand upon doctrine. There's stability when we condemn errors. But when we condemn individuals, and when we say all manner of evil against this individual or that individual, though sometimes there must be a public exposing of some evils of individuals, occasionally this must be done. But what is our primary duty? Stand for the faith, stand for the truth. Defend against the lies. For the father of lies is using lies in order to destroy the sheep. We must defend against the father of lies by condemning those lies. By understanding the truth and loving the truth. And so in our present crisis in the society of St. Pius X. In this present crisis. We must stand for the truth. And we are finding down the last three years. A steady growth. A steady development. And it is built upon the solidness of the faith. We must give the sacraments as best we can. We must give the truth as clearly as possible. We must condemn the errors. And let God take care of the individuals who hold these errors. Some of them mean very well. Some of them are trying their very best. And we hope that they can come away from it. A priest within the Society of St. Pius X needs to be told, Father, Father, you need to step out. Father, you need to stand up. What you're doing isn't going to work. The secret resisting is only known by those who secretly know you're secretly resisting. What about the other ones? What about the ones that meet you that you don't know? And you don't speak to them about the truth. Maybe they want the truth. Why, our Lord said the truth must be put on a candle stand and not hidden under a bushel. And so we must put the truth out in public. And remember, we're standing for the truth against the errors. Not this person against that person. This individual against that individual. This good, who's being true and who's cheating who. That's not our interest. We may make many mistakes when we make those kinds of judgments. God alone judges the souls. We judge the truth with a just judgment. And we recommend that which follows the teachings of our fathers and our ancestors down the last 2,000 years. And we don't need to make any other recommendations. We don't need to rebuild any wheels. We continue the work of our children of the faith. There must be a continuation of the truth. There must be a continuation of the seminaries and the communication of the truth. There must be a continuation of the priesthood. There must be a continuation of, the, of, the, of our little chapels. There must be a continuation of preaching the truth for as long as God allows us to go on. And at whatever time we die, we need to be found having been pre preaching the truth at that time. And then, that's no trouble. At whatever time we fail, that's no trouble. Individuals fail easily. Individuals collapse easily. It's not important. God will raise up always enough souls to, to be warriors in his kingdom. He will always raise up priests. He will always raise up bishops. He will always raise up faithful. He will always raise up souls to be faithful to him until the end of time. No matter how small the number is, they will never be the number zero. And will always be faithful, some souls, some Catholics until the end of time. We hope to be numbered amongst those Catholics. And if we find ourselves not amongst those Catholics, we ought to be forgiven and be pulled into the number of those Catholics. We only want to be faithful Catholics, holding the faith, defending the faith, condemning the errors, trying to help the sheep to get to the kingdom of heaven. That's what must be done. And we shouldn't worry about who's good and who's not good, who's holy and who's not holy. Let God worry about that. We'll close that. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.